Well, good morning. We'll get to that video in a moment, but first I want to take care of a couple matters. I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Matt uh, Herndon, lead pastor at Rooftop. Uh, also, I want to wish you a happy... Am I cutting out? It sounds like I'm cutting out. Guys, can you tell I'm cutting out? Can the sound booth tell that I'm cutting out? That's the real question. I'm gonna da, 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 da. All right, now I'm not cutting out. All right. I love this expression from the sound booth. <laughs> <laughs> we get like twice a Sunday. <clears throat> so I'm going to keep talking, and if it doesn't work out, I'll just start shouting. Uh, well, I want to wish you a happy new year. Happy new year. Thirdly, I want to welcome visitors among us. If you're visiting us here this morning, it takes a lot of guts and courage to check out a new church on a new year. So we're really honored and grateful that you're here. Also want to throw in one last minute announcement that didn't get uh, plugged. We have a, the Mexico crew got back this past week. Uh, welcome. Uh, raise your hand if you went to Mexico on the rooftop mission trip. Yeah. One person over there. It was really a group there, Jared. Yeah. So, oh, like the corner crew. Okay. We're doing it again in spring, over spring break. And uh, this is a new opportunity. And if you're interested, and you, if you can't go over winter break, but you can maybe go over spring break, uh, I don't know the date, Steve. 17th to the 23rd of March. Uh, if you're interested, next week, show up after either service right here for 15 minutes to get the details. So that's the last minute announcement. Lastly, I want to tell you what we're doing this morning. Uh, we're starting a new series, as Jeremy said, here at Rooftop, called Next Step, the series. And this series is our attempt to relaunch our Next Steps campaign. You probably know this. We're in the middle of a building search uh, because we believe that's God's next step for us. We need more space in a better location. Uh, in order to keep growing and serving St. Louis. But in order to reach that goal, we decided to raise some money to put ourselves in a better position to do that. So we launched the campaign last spring. Uh, it's going great, but it's easy for efforts like this to flag. So we knew that we wanted to relaun relaunch the campaign at the midway point to keep the fire hot. So we're taking a break from our extended study of the Gospel of John to do something more strategic. At the end of this message, in fact, uh, Blake Aarons, our campaign director, is going to come up and give us a more specific update on how the campaign is going. So I know that might distract you from the message. You just cannot wait to hear from Blake Aarons, of all people, about how the campaign is going. But if you will, just restrain your anticipation so we can study God's Word together. But the Next Steps campaign isn't the only reason we're doing this series. That is just one practical expression of what we're really talking about. What we're really talking about, when it comes down to it, what this series is really all about is about walking with God. That's why it's called the Next Steps series. The series is about the forward movement God expects of and inspires among his people. Not that I hope you are, but you could be completely uninterested in the capital campaign and still have a ton to get out of the series because whether or not you're either even involved in the campaign God still wants you to step forward with him, to walk with him in whatever direction you are going. You see, walking with God is a very popular image in Scripture. People were always walking, both literally and metaphorically. They knew that it meant something. Micah, for example, tells us to walk humbly with God. The psalmist tells us that the righteous man does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. God instructs Abraham in Genesis to walk before me and be blameless. John writes that we must walk as Jesus walked. Paul tells his readers to walk in newness in life. I could go on and on and on. The word walk and step occur hundreds and hundreds of times in the Bible. The image is popular in the Bible because this is how people got around back then. They didn't talk about segueing with God or biking with God. This is just how they moved around. But the image in Scripture is popular because this is what God created us to do. He created us to walk, to move, to step. He didn't create us to be rocks. He created us to take action, to make advances, to push forward. This is very important because far too many people, even far too many of God's people, aren't steppers. We live very spiritually sedentary lives. We might be very active. But that doesn't mean we aren't spiritually sedentary. Do you know what it means to be sedentary? The word sedentary comes from, this is going to be impressive, a Latin word, sedentarius, and it means literally to sit in one place. All sorts of Americans live very sedentary lives which involve a lack of movement, and the consequences of sedentary lifestyles can be deadly. There's even a clinical name for unhealthy inactivity. It's called sitting disease or sedentary death syndrome. 
And according to Prevention.com, it kills more than 300,000 Americans each year who die from inactivity-related illnesses like diabetes, heart disease, obesity. Sedentary death syndrome is the disease of not doing anything. Our bodies were meant to be physically active. We were given legs to what? Walk. We were given muscles to flex. When we're not actually using our bodies according to how they were designed, we get sick and eventually we die. And the fundamental concept behind this series is that not only were our bodies made to walk, but our spirits were too. Our spirits were made to move and explore and grow. But just as millions of Americans are physically sedentary, even more of us are spiritually sedentary. Far too many of us sit like bumps on logs, not actively following Jesus. That's not just boring, but it's unhealthy. Our spirits get fat and lazy and unresponsive and we die a slow spiritual death. So our purpose during this series isn't just to raise money. It's to take a look at what it means to walk with God as the scriptures describe. We're going to spend five weeks looking at the metaphor of stepping as it occurs in scripture. We're going to talk about obedience, for example, and how Peter tells us to walk, to follow in the steps of Christ. We're going to talk about intimacy and how the Bible tells us to keep in step with the Spirit. We're going to talk about community and how the Bible tells us to keep in step with each other in a spirit of love and humility. We're going to talk about wisdom and how the Bible tells us to step carefully, knowing where to go, what direction to head in. This morning, though, we're going to talk about faith. Not only does the Bible tell us to step behind, to step with, to step together, and to step carefully, but the Bible tells us to step out in faith, which brings us back to Indy. Maybe you remember that scene from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I can't believe it came out in 1992. He's desperately trying to get the cup of Christ so he can use its water to heal his father, but he has to pass those three tests, and the third test is the most daunting. Between him and the cup of Christ is a huge bottomless chasm with no way to cross. All he has is a picture of a knight walking on air across the gulf in a crazy act of bold Hollywood faith. He takes the leap of faith and steps out onto an invisible walk bridge. If you were like me, I can still remember watching that scene and holding my breath and tensing up as he put his leg out and fell forward. Nobody knew how it was going to work. Worked out all right. This isn't too far, though, from how the Bible instructs God's people to walk. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, we walk by faith, not by sight. And he writes in Romans that God is the father of those who walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had. This is what it means by definition to be a follower of Christ, to walk by faith, to move forward without knowing necessarily how things are going to walk out or where you're even heading. Speaking of Abraham, that's what Paul says, that God is the father of those who walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had. Speaking of Abraham, maybe you know his story. It's very instructive when it comes to walking in faith. Abraham was the father of the Jewish people. Way back in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, God called Abraham out of nowhere and made this random old guy some great, big, huge promises that nobody would have any reason to expect. He promised Abraham that he would make his name a blessing to the world. He promised Abraham to bless him with more descendants that he could count. He promised Abraham to bless him, even though he and his wife Sarah were barren and old. He promised to bless him with a child, promised to make them into a huge nation. But in order for Abraham to receive all those blessings, he had to do something. God came down with some instructions. He appeared somehow to Abraham, and he told him this. Abraham, leave your country, leave your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I've always loved this verse because it's absolutely insane. Have you ever noticed that God does not tell Abraham where to go? He just says, leave. He doesn't tell him, head north, about 40 clicks, catch the river, go west, find your way down south to the mountain. He just says, leave. 
God knows that the first step to going anywhere is leaving. And a lot of times we get so obsessed with knowing where we're going and making the right arrangements that we never actually get around to going. That's why God took it a step at a time with Abraham. He said, I will show you where to go. I will take you there. But first, you got to show me something. You've got to show me that you're willing to trust me and follow me wherever it is I take you. God knows that it's sometimes easier to direct a moving body than it is to get a stationary body going. Moving bodies have kinetic energy. They have momentum that he can use and direct. God understood Newton's first law of motion. You know Newton's first law of motion. I think you guys have, amidst the mumbling, bodies at rest tend to... Stay at rest. Bodies in motion tend to stay in motion. Objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Unless something acted on Abraham from the outside, he was just going to stay a bump on a log in Ur, dying from spiritual sedentary disorder. It didn't really matter which direction he headed in. He just needed to get moving. And in religious terms, this is called walking by faith. It means moving forward as you best feel and think. God, through Scripture, is directing you trusting that he will be there to support your steps. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but our capital campaign is a perfect illustration of walking by faith. The elder team, the spiritual leaders here at Rooftop, we debated for months whether or not we wanted to launch this campaign, launch this effort, before we actually had a building, before we actually had a location. I mean, the experts on capital campaigns will tell you that it's far easier to raise interest in a destination. People want to give to what they can see. I mean, if you're spending lots of money on a vacation, do you just blindly go somewhere? You get on the internet to see where you're going. We don't have a building. We don't have a location. We don't even have, we don't even know how much it's going to cost. We have nothing to show you. Nothing. We were talking about putting together some brochures. I said, what do we even put on the brochure? Text? That's inspiring. But we're not vacationers. We're Christians. We walk by faith. I was talking to Jeremy this week. He gave me another illustration. He told me that several years ago, uh, he meditated on this verse about Abraham for months, trying to discern God's next step for him and his family. And eventually he decided to I'll leave a comfortable ministry position at a great church, even though he had nothing else lined up and a family to support. Eventually, after many months of prayer, God led him here. Some people might call that crazy, considering where it led him. <laughs> to rooftop in St. Louis. St. Louis. Did you ever think? St. Louis. But the Bible calls that walking by faith. Michelle and I made a similar uh, crazy decision when we decided to adopt. We had no idea how that would go. We heard all the adoption horror stories. When we were thinking about adopting, everybody had an adoption horror story to tell us about. Did you hear about that Russian kid that, like, was terrible, and they put him on a plane? Did you hear about, you know, that family that got locked in Honduras? Everybody, thank you for all your adoption horror stories. Thank you. We appreciated all that wisdom. Then our coordinator one evening brought over a tiny little picture of a newborn and we were sitting there on Halloween night, and we just had to decide, do we step forward or not? I mean, this child could be the devil. This child could be an angel. As it is, she's an angel with devilish tendencies. <laughs> but we had to step. Life as a Christian is, by definition, a walk of faith. We live for a homeland we cannot see. We live lives of holiness for a reward that has only been loosely described to us in Scripture. We walk by faith, not sight, or do we? The Bible says we should, but that doesn't mean we do. Like I said, many of us are suffering from spiritual sedentary death syndrome. We struggle to step out in faith when we have the opportunity and our spirits suffer because of it. Why can we be so inactive? Why do we stay stuck on the ledge? Well, in my experience, with myself and with others, it seems to me that people are held back from walking in faith by one of three conditions. 
They're held back by confusion. They're held back by comfort. And they're held back by cowardice. And this morning with the time I have left, I thought it would be interesting and helpful to talk about the forces that can keep us on the ledge. Confusion, comfort, and cowardice, starting with the first. People are cut from walking in faith by confusion. What I mean is that people get so confused by what to do that they end up doing nothing. In his book, The Paradox of Choice, author Barry Schwartz argues that we have too many choices in life. According to him, choice is a good thing. It's good that we live in a society where we can choose what we want to be, where we want to eat, where we want to live. But according to him, we're way past the point where choice is good for us. We have so many choices that our brains are trained to not be satisfied except with the very best option. And this can leave us paralyzed and confused. A few months ago, for example, I went out looking for some new sandals. My wife has just laughed because she remembers this. <clears throat> I don't really like wearing sandals because I have ugly feet, but I, I had a case of athlete's foot. And my nurse wife said that open-toed shoes apparently help athlete's foot uh, heal. Is that too much information? So I went out to buy some sandals. I had no idea this would be difficult. They're just sandals. Uh, growing up, I just wore the flip-flops my mom bought for me. But now there's different styles and brands and colors and sandals, shoe hybrids. I went to five stores, five shoe stores, tried on dozens of sandals with my athlete's foot, which is kind of gross if you think about it. <laughs> I was so obsessed with finding the most comfortable, most functional, least weird-looking, best economic option that I didn't know when to stop, and as it is, I actually came home sandalless and very depressed because I'd just been defeated by the sandal industry. I hate shopping because I really do, I hate shopping because I get so confused by the options. Buying jeans is insane. You got this size and that size and style and places and cost and this is amusing when it comes to sandals and jeans, but it's more of a problem when I'm trying to make big decisions like who to marry, which church to get involved in, which job to take. We're convinced there's one best option out there, and we've been trained by our society to wait for the perfect option. As it turns out, though, we end up just sitting on the list. I know of people that spend years looking for the perfect church. They never find it, and so they never end up going anywhere. I have a friend who needed to get healthy, but didn't know if he should run, bike, or join a gym. So instead of making a decision in faith, he just stayed on his couch. This is why God's words to Abraham are so critical. God tells him, go to the land I will show you. He doesn't tell him where. He doesn't tell him anything. He just tells him, go. That actually sounds unwise to me. I mean, west, east, north, south, up, down. But it's a critical part of following Christ. God knows it's more important we get going than it is to be going in the right direction. I dare say God would sometimes prefer we take a step in the wrong direction than no step in any direction. Because like I said, it's easier to direct a moving body than it is a body of rest. If you're facing a decision right now about life, about relationships, about family, about church, about school, about work. Don't waste too much time being confused. Don't waste too much time deciding between good options. Just go. You're not going to get in trouble from the Lord by doing what the Bible tells you to do. Confusion keeps people from walking in faith. As does comfort. When we're satisfied with life, we have less reason to take bold steps of faith. When we're comfortable, we have less incentive to take risks that we don't necessarily need to take. Have you seen the movie WALL-E? Um, in the movie, <clears throat> humans have ruined the earth and have traveled to space waiting for the earth to become habitable again. Out in space, they have designed life to be as comfortable as possible. They all ride around in floating carts talking to each other on video screens, being spoon-fed by machines. Over many generations, 
700 years, in fact, they get so fat and cozy that what happens? They forget about earth. They even forget how to walk. They, they forget that that's what their legs are for. And why would they need to? They're comfortable. And I think the same thing happens to us and to our spirits. We get so comfortable that we see no reason to take risks. And we get so comfortable that we forget where we are and what we're doing. We forget about earth, which in Bible terms is not earth, but heaven. We weren't made for earth. We were made for heaven, but we've been here so long. I mean, it's all we've ever known that we've decided to settle in and get cozy. We buy nice homes. We buy nice cars. We live for earthly dreams. And that's what I think part of what's going on in the story of Abraham. We don't know much about Abraham's life back in his homeland of Ur, which is a really interesting name for a homeland, Ur. But I imagine back in Ur, he was comfortable. I mean, God certainly implies that he was. God tells Abraham, leave your country, your people, your father's household. Leave everything you know. You're comfortable. You're satisfied. You've got a country. You've got a people. You've got a household. But you weren't made for Ur. I have something greater, something better for you, your own homeland. And Abraham went. For us, Abraham's new homeland represents heaven, the place where we can truly be satisfied And it requires a massive amount of faith to get there. We have to summon up the courage to leave everything we're comfortable with. In order to get to heaven, we have to be willing to give up earth. We have to be willing to give up our reputation. We have to be willing to give up our money. We have to be willing to give up our time. We have to be willing to give up anything that makes us comfortable. We'll get more in the end. We'll We'll be more blessed than even Abraham was, and he was supremely blessed. But we have to remember that we weren't made to live here in outer space forever. And we have to tell God through our sacrifices that we'll go wherever he takes us. Maybe your own comfort is keeping you from really walking in faith. Maybe you're so cozy with your job, your reputation, your income that you've forgotten you weren't made to live here forever. Maybe you need to leave something, sacrifice something to show God that you follow him wherever he takes you. Comfort keeps us from walking in faith. That's this confusion. And lastly, cowardice. Cowardice keeps us from stepping out. We're afraid of what might happen if we step out in faith. And to be sure, plenty of bad stuff could happen to people who make risky decisions. There's absolutely no guarantee that everything will go well. Everything will go well eventually. But in order for everything to go well eventually, it's almost required that in immediately everything needs to fall apart completely take abraham i wish i could tell you that after he stepped out in faith and left her everything went beautiful from uh, beautifully from him far from it read the, are you familiar with the life of abraham read the next few chapters of abraham's life following his call and you'll see how things worked out he faces a drought his wife gets kidnapped He has an affair with his maidservant, gets her pregnant, gets caught up in a war. He and his nephew have a conflict, have to part ways. He has a child with his wife, but then God tells him to sacrifice his one and only son and then tells him not to. To cap it all off, God asks him to get circumcised and cut off the tip of his penis. Then he dies. This was Abraham's life after He was called to step out in faith. He didn't see any of his descendants other than his son. Wasn't much of a blessing to anybody. This was his life after the call. The author of Hebrews puts it well. Abraham was still living by faith when he died. He did not receive the things promised. He only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. When we step out in faith, we are guaranteed We are uh, guaranteed that things will go well eventually. God promises to lead us to heaven. But there is no guarantee that things will go well immediately. In fact, just the opposite is true. If there were that guarantee, it wouldn't be faith. We've been discussing this as an elder team. Uh, at some point, your leaders here at Rooftop are going to have to make a strategic decision about our future, where and what we move into. It could go great, or it could go terribly, like Peter in the boat. You know, story of Peter in the boat? Sees Jesus out walking on the Sea of Galilee. What does he get out to do? 
walk with him. He walks a couple steps, and then what happens? He sinks. We could walk miraculously on the water. It could go great. Or we could sink. It could stink. Sinking would stink. I like that. But it could happen. We are guaranteed nothing. What we are guaranteed is that God will be with us all the way. We are guaranteed to learn and grow and feel his presence through it. Even as Peter was sinking in the water, Jesus reached down and pulled him out. It's through our risky steps of faith that we're really able to experience God and learn to trust in him. It's when we push through our fears that we discover what knowing God is really like, which leads to a question. What big, crazy, bold step of faith would you take if you knew that even if it went badly, God would be with you all the way, making it work out perfectly in the end? What big, crazy, bold step of faith would you take knowing that even if it worked out badly, God would be with you all the way and work it out perfectly for your good in the end? Would you quit your job, go back to school? Would you attempt reconciliation with a loved one? Would you sign up for a small group, get more involved in church? Would you make a pledge of the capital campaign, trusting that God is going to take care of you? What bold step of faith would you take if you knew, without a doubt, that God would be with you all the way? I am telling you, on the authority of Scripture and on the example of the heroes of the faith, that that's the truth. God will be with you all the way, making sure that whatever bad decisions you make will ultimately work out for your good in the end. Will you take that step? And see where God takes you, or will you stand at the ledge paralyzed by your cowardice, your comfort, and your confusion? I promise you that this series is bigger than our capital campaign, but I also don't want to pretend it has nothing to do with it. God's calling us to take a big step of faith as a church, and this series will hopefully prepare us to take it. So this might be a little different, but we're going to conclude this message this morning with an unapologetic reintroduction of our Next Steps campaign so that you can know how it's going, how you can participate, if that's something that you feel God calling you to participate in by faith. Really, it's my privilege to do this because I get to introduce you to one of my six favorite elders here at Rooftop. His name is Blake Ahrens, and he volunteered last year to coordinate the campaign. He's going to come up for a few minutes, uh, give you a summary of how things are going, and explain how you can be a part of it if you want to. So, ladies and gentlemen, will you welcome to the stage Blake Q. Aarons. Thank you. Okay, I'll turn the thing down. As Matt mentioned, my name is Blake Aarons. I'm an elder here at Rooftop, and I chair the Next Steps campaign. And as Matt's been talking about, the Next Steps campaign is about so much more than just a capital campaign. Uh, From the beginning of Rooftop, we've had a line item in our budget that we've called Next Steps. The very first budget had Next Steps. And that's because we've always known that as a church, we were going to have a next step that we needed to take. Uh, That Next Step line item in the budgets turned into things like Jeremy and Jason and this building that we're in right now, right? the things we bought were, were pretty faces like Jeremy and Jason's, but, but, really, but really they were investments in what God's doing here. Uh, what we want to do is we want to help the people of St. Louis take their next step towards God. And when we hired our pastors and so forth, we hired them because, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we, we hired them because we needed more people to be discipled. We needed more people to be evangelized. <clears throat> I need a drink of water. And we really needed uh, people to be loved on. Thank you. I have a virus. Thank you. Is there there athlete's foot in this or anything like that? (laughs) Thank you. Sorry. By show of hands, who was here to see Matt dance gingham style in a Grinch suit on Christmas Eve? Anybody see that? It was a packed house, as most of our Christmas Eve services have been. 
And imagine what it's going to be like next year when I hear that Matt's going to sing Gingham style while Jeremy, Jason, and Heather dress as elves and do the dance. So it's, it's going to be crazy. But seriously, if you missed that service, do yourself a favor. Check it out on the Rooftop channel on YouTube. Our video guys do a great, great job there. Uh, it's classic. My kids are hoping it goes viral. Uh, but here's the sad part about that service and what you may not have known. Do you know we intentionally limited our marketing uh, to the surrounding community for our Christmas Eve service because we knew we wouldn't have enough room? See, we normally send out flyers to a, a large group of people in the community, people that have maybe attended Rooftop once or twice and then stepped away uh, in the hopes of attracting them back to our church. But this year at Christmas Eve, we had to cut that back significantly uh, because we were afraid they might actually come. So, I mean, think about that for a moment. It's heartbreaking. We were afraid that if all these people showed up, in addition to our, our regular selves, that the place would be overcrowded, uncomfortable, awkward, and they'd never want to come back. That's not who we want to be as a church, right? That's not what, what Rooftop's about. That's not why this church was started. Uh, and that's why we created the Next Steps Capital Campaign. Because as a church, one of our next steps now has to be a bigger facility so that we can invite our friends and our neighbors and have room for, for those kinds of things. So not quite a year ago when we launched, launched this campaign uh, with the building ball, anybody remember the building ball? Uh, we've, we've accumulated about $300,000 in pledges. The specific numbers are in your bulletin. Uh, we've collected about $155,000 of that in between pledges and fundraising. Uh, but our goal was $400,000. So we're $100,000 short of what we thought we needed. And so at the one-year mark of the, the two-year campaign here, we wanted to take the opportunity to ask the people of Rooftop to finish strong and accomplish what God set before us here. And I know that many of you sitting out here today, uh, a year ago, weren't even at Rooftop. Or maybe you'd attended a couple of times, but you weren't really committed to it yet. So today I want to ask you guys in particular to consider prayerfully joining our campaign to help Rooftop take its next step. The church is a body and we need all of us working together, people that have been here from the beginning and people that are new uh, to participate in order to thrive. And I also know that there's plenty of you out there who've already made a sacrificial pledge to the campaign and I want to say thank you uh, to you guys. But I'd ask you, uh, is there more that you could do? Is there a bonus, a tax refund, something else in your future that you could direct a part of what God's doing here at Rooftop? Did you give cautiously last year, but want to give boldly this year as you think about taking your next step? Uh, is there a way to stretch deeper? In your programs today, you'll find a pledge card. Looks like this, it says new steps. So this is a pledge card is for people who feel led to make a pledge for the first time, or for people who wish to increase their pledge uh, from what they gave before. If you've already given a pledge, you don't intend to do anything else, uh, that's fine. You don't need to fill this out. But for everybody else, take it home, pray about it, talk with your spouse about it or somebody you're accountable to, and bring it back. You're going to have an opportunity uh, over the next five weeks of the sermon series to uh, drop it in the offering bag. And as God challenges you to take your next step in your walk uh, over the next couple of months, just think about if participating in this capital campaign should be a part of that.